1977, a wealthy gentleman from California who made his fortune from rental properties decided that he was ready to invest in one of those fancy NASCAR teams much as everyone else would back then, correct? Eh, maybe not everyone that background. But, the man who did this was Mr. Rod Osterlund, who was the owner of multiple cars in NASCAR's Cup Series between eight seasons from 1977 to 1991. In my next installment of The Rise and Fall, I'd like to examine the history of this once great team. Osterlund Racing would begin racing in 1977 when they would enter car number 91 with driver Roland Wladiga, I cannot say that correctly, as the driver in the Cam 2 Motor Oil 400 at Michigan. Roland would finish 29th in this race after starting 36th. Later in the year, Roland would make four more starts in Rod Osterlund's number 98 car. During the 1977 season, Osterlund would see his team run a total of 12 races with Sam Summers, Jimmy Means, Dick May, Dave Marcus, and Marv Action all making starts for Osterlund Racing, and none of these drivers were able to score a top 10. Then, in 1978, Osterlund Racing would compete in 30 races with Dave Marcus behind the wheel of the number 2 car, primarily with the support of Shoney's as a primary sponsor of the car, and although he did not win in 1978, he still gave the team a fantastic run in Osterlund's car, finishing 5th in the point standings with 14 top 5s, 24 top 10s, and 115 laps in the lead. I guess it was then when the world was introduced as just how quick Osterlund's number 2 car truly was. In addition to Marcus, Rod Osterlund also owned a number 5 Armor All Chevy driven by Neil Bonnet during the last half of 1978, as Jim Stacy owned Bonnet's number 5 for the first half of 1978. Then, for a handful of races, Osterlund would field a third car to number 98 driven six times by his first driver, Roland, with the name I can't say, so I'm sorry. One start by Jimmy and Solo, and at the end of 1978, the car was piloted by Dale Earnhardt, who started 10th and finished 4th, and with that, I believe Osterlund struck gold for his racing team as we discussed the restructuring of Osterlund Racing in 1979. 1979 brought in a new era for the team. They only competed with one car, the number 2, and with the help of crew chief Jake Elder and the driving talent of Cup Series rookie Dale Earnhardt for 27 races, along with veteran driver David Pearson who raced races 20 through 23, the two car had one of its best years to date. In the four races ran by Pearson, he started 2nd, 1st, 3rd, and 5th in that order, and he finished 2nd, 4th, 7th, and 1st in that order, getting himself and Austrian Racing a win at Darlington in 1979. In the other 27 races of 1979, Dale Earnhardt would score 11 top 5s, 17 top 10s, 4 pole awards, he led for 605 laps, and at the 1979 Spring Race at Bristol, Earnhardt would win his first race of his legendary career driving Austrian's number 2 car. Despite missing out on 4 races, Earnhardt's performance was still good enough to win him NASCAR Rookie of the Year honors as well as a 7th place points finish. What's even more interesting from this season is that before Pearson took over for his four races, Earnhardt was running fifth in point standings, and a number two was competitive enough for top tens, top fives, and one win in those four races. When Earnhardt returned, he was in 11th in points, and he still rallied to finish seventh in the standings. It makes me wonder then, had Dale ran all the races in 1979, could that have quite possibly been his missing ring for his eighth championship? But regardless, we can't dwell on what could have been, but rather celebrate what did happen, as before Dale Earnhardt became a seven-time champion of NASCAR, he had to become a one-time champion first. And in 1980, Earnhardt along with crew chiefs Jake Elder and Doug Richard would take Osterlund's number two for a total of five wins, 19 top fives, 24 top tens, and 1,185 laps in the lead en route to the 1980 Cup Series Championship, and it looked as though the number two team was going to be NASCAR's biggest and best combination with Dale Earnhardt behind the wheel. However, in 1981, the team was looking for a repeat championship run, but instead, halfway through the season after race number six, at Michigan, Osterlund shockingly sold his top-level team to owner Jim Stacy, and with that, Rod Osterlund was out of NASCAR just like that. Before the sale, Earnhardt had scored 10 top 10s, 7 top 5s, and was scored 4th in the Cup Series point standings that season. For the next four races, Earnhardt would continue racing for J.D. Stacy's number 2 car with Wrangler staying as primary sponsor, but this pairing just did not work out. After the 20th race of 1981, Dale Earnhardt would take sponsor Wrangler Jeans over to Richard Childress's available number 3 entry, and from there, the rest was his history for Dale Earnhardt. While many may have thought that was it, Osterlund Racing was done for good. That would later prove to not be the case, as in 1989, Rod Osterlund was back in the racing game with driver Hutt Strickland behind the wheel of Osterlund's appropriately sponsored Heinz 57 Pontiac. 
During Strickland's 1989 campaign for Austral, he would score only one top five and four top tens, failing to qualify for the 1989 Daytona 500, along with the fourth race of the year at Richmond, missing a total of six races in 1989. The following season in 1990, Austral in racing was able to retain Heinz as the primary sponsor of the 57 car, this time featuring Jimmy Spencer as the driver for the first 26 races, where he would only lead 10 laps and record only two top tens, as well as driver Jim Brown for races 27 through 29, whose average finish in three starts in the 57 was just 31st place. Finally, in 1991, Rod Osterlin would finally give up the NASCAR game when Buddy Baker would drive Osterlin's number 88 entry in the 1991 Daytona 500 en route to a 37th place finish. After this race, Osterlin would sell the remainder of his team to Dick Moroso, and that was the end of Osterlin Racing. It was a rather quick chapter in terms of great teams in NASCAR, and it had a fast rise with an even harder and quicker fall with no room to rise once again. But regardless, the ownership career of Rod Osterlin was enough to earn him a spot in the West Coast Stock Car Hall of Fame in 2010, and personally, I believe I would see a future spot for Austin in NASCAR's Hall of Fame. But what do you think? Was Austin Racing's legacy strong enough for such an accolade? Leave some comments down below, and let the debate begin. Also, I do ask for you to please give the video a like, it really does help my channel out a lot. Also, be sure to hit the subscribe button, and be sure to turn on notifications for future content like this. This is Danny B, and thanks so much for watching, and I hope you have a great day. Bye, guys.